I hope that everyone's had a wonderful day. I know that I have. It's a wonderful day. The best part about it is being with the brethren on the first day of the week to come together to worship God. We can say that absolutely as a truth. Tonight we come together to continue our praise and honor and worship of our Father and Jesus, the Son. And we study from the Word because, as we talked about this morning, that's going to be the standard of judgment. We're going to be responsible for the things that are revealed and written therein. And following the same theme this morning, we, we want to get down to some basics about issues that affect all of us. And we know that the, the issue of marriage is a very important one. And perhaps you're married. Maybe you're not. But maybe you will be. Maybe you're prospectively looking for a spouse. We studied how in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus gave his commandments concerning marriage. Friends, it's supposed to be for life. And we need to drill that into our children. That you have to be careful about who you pick to spend your life with because it's supposed to be for life. That's the intention. That's, that's what the Word of God says. We have to honor marriage. For God honors marriage. He's the one that created it and he didn't make mistakes. Now sadly, sometimes we find that there are situations when adultery does enter into the equation. Uh, there was adultery in the days of Jesus. And over in the book of John in chapter 8, here is a story, a real story, about a woman taken in adultery. We understand that the individuals, the scribes and the Pharisees that brought this woman to Jesus was not being honest in their hearts. They weren't really wanting justice they were wanting to trick and trap Jesus into contradicting the old law so that they would have reason to condemn him. And as we read in John chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote up on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now here's a story in the life of Jesus in which there was a woman brought by the scribes and the Pharisees. The leaders of the Jews, those who felt that they were the most strict of the Jews. The most righteous. And it says <clears throat> unto Jesus, they called him master or teacher, which they weren't interested in Jesus being their teacher. But you know, that's kind of what people do. If somebody has some really bad news for you, they want to first give you a compliment. Have you experienced that? You know, when they say, you know, I want to talk to you. <clears throat> you. You know, you're a really good person. You're a sharp dresser. And you've got a nice smile. And you're so good to people. But, watch out for that, that but, see. <laughs> and then here comes the criticism. 
That kind of pop psychology has been around for thousands of years, I suppose. And I just really don't like that. If we've got something to discuss, let's discuss it. You don't have to fluff up, you know, the situation. And here are the scribes and the Pharisees, they're kind of fluffers. They're out to get Jesus. They're out for blood, and they called him Master. Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now that tells us that adultery is an act. And I know that you can correctly point out that Jesus also said that whosoever looketh upon a woman the lest after her hath committed adultery with her in his heart. That's true, but that's lust in the heart, adultery in the heart. But actual adultery is an act of adultery. It's kind of like John wrote about, you know, about hating your brother. If you hate your brother, you're a murderer. You know, you're not an actual literal murderer, but you're a murderer as far as the heart's concerned. And that's how Jesus feels about it. And that's, that's how he equates it, hatred with murder, lust, adultery in the heart. This woman was taken in the very act. And they said, tempting him, they were testing him so that they might have to accuse him. See, that's their motivation. They have a bad motivation. They weren't honest and sincere. They weren't seeking the justice under the law of Moses that was prescribed. <laughs> Besides that, if you caught this woman in the very act, I will assure you there was somebody else there. And where's he at? Because the old law prescribed the stoning for both parties, not just one. It wasn't just the woman. And so Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. What you think he was writing? I don't know. Nobody does. But he was just simply following his own law. But you've got to be swift to hear and slow to speak. <laughs> and, and he's being slow to speak. He's handling the situation. He's writing on the ground. But they persisted. And they continued to ask him the same question. He lifted up himself, and here's his answer. He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. What did he write? I don't know. Doesn't say. We can't speculate. We can't add to the word. We can't draw in, well, this is what I think. Because that means nothing. And that's what, how we have to approach the word of God. Do you think that the uh, <clears throat> scribes and the Pharisees knew what they were doing? And why they had brought that woman to Jesus? That it was because of the hypocrisy in their heart? Of course they knew. And as they contemplated, at least they thought about what Jesus had said to them. It says they were convicted by their own conscience. And one by one, beginning at the eldest, they left, even unto the last. And there was Jesus by himself with this woman. Jesus stood back up, looked around, didn't see anybody but the woman. He said, woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus is not sanctioning this woman's sin. There are folks that, that are trying to use this passage to say that somehow Jesus violated... The Old Testament law. And by doing so, he's teaching us that, you know, don't be so strict about the law. It's okay. You can kind of fudge a little here and fudge a little bit there and do a little compromising as long as the end result's okay. People are actually teaching that. I say that is absolutely incorrect because if Jesus had 
started picking up rocks and throwing it at this woman, that would have been a sin because he did not witness the act and you could not in, impose the death penalty of the law of Moses unless you had the two or three witnesses. And Jesus didn't see it. And we'd be sitting here condemning Jesus. Because he'd start throwing rocks. Now that's a painful death, you know that. I mean, what these Pharisees were asking to be done is something that, yes, the law of Moses did command. But you think about someone picking up a, a rock, a little bitty rock, and hitting you with it. And that would hurt. Pick up a little bigger one and zing it at you and hit you in the head. I don't know if our young people know how to throw rocks. But in times where they didn't have these wonderful weapons at the ready, people learn how to throw rocks, let me tell you. And they're accurate with them. Oh, I guess I need to tell you about Jamaica again. I really don't do this a lot, but... You know, Jamaica, they really don't have a lot of great big dogs because it's hard enough for the people to get fed and get enough to eat, okay? And they don't have enough leftovers to feed the dogs, so they're kind of small dogs. They can be vicious. They'll eat you up. People keep them around for that very purpose. Well, if you know me, I don't get along too well with dogs. You know, I guess that was from childhood trauma. I don't know what happened to Jesse and his cats, but I know I had childhood trauma. I had a friend that, and uh, I've told some of you older folks this, uh, a dog named Booger. Booger was an old dog. Booger had three legs. Booger hopped around like this, you know, and on those three legs, and I'd come over, and Booger would get excited every time anybody would knock on that door. And here Booger would come, and they would stand there and let Booger bite me. That's true. That Booger would start biting me, and I didn't like it a bit. Booger would bite me. Booger didn't have any teeth, but he sure gummed hard enough. That's a true story, Booger. The day Booger died, I attended Booger's funeral. I, I didn't do it. I really didn't. And they, they took Booger and they took one of the blankets from the bed and they wrapped Booger up and they dug the hole and they carried Booger to the grave and we were there having a Booger funeral and everybody was sad and I was looking down and my heart was rejoicing. <laughs> They don't have booger dogs in Jamaica, okay? Those dogs are small. But I didn't tell you that, that Booger was a boxer, a boxer named Booger. But anyway, those little dogs, what I was taught, I had to be taught by these little bitty boys in Jamaica. Well, what you got to do when those dogs come after you? If you got to reach down and pick up a rock. And the moment you have this action of leaning down to pick up the rock, those dogs are gone. Well, they didn't know that I couldn't hit the broad side of a barn with a rock. That mine was not very good at all. But the dogs didn't know that. Because rocks hurt. Now, instead of throwing a rock at a dog, what if you threw it at a human being? What if three people started picking up rocks and throwing at you and it would hit you in the head and on the leg? Maybe it's ten people that would throw rocks. It would hit you over and over and over again and you would crumple to the ground and they would continue to throw the rocks at you and hit you until you died. That's what they were asking Jesus to do to this woman. 
He that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. That's Jesus' message to the world. He wasn't violating the law of Moses. He wasn't contradicting it. He wasn't going against it. And he didn't even tell them that they shouldn't stone the woman. But he in his wisdom told them, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Now we need this lesson, okay? Because first of all, it tells you how horrible adultery is. How terrible it is. It's not good. It's not good. But it also tells you of Jesus' forgiveness. And of his love for mankind. And we ought not be sitting back and be too harsh on one another when we know that, well, you know, that guy, he's a thief. He's a horrible person, but I'm a big liar, you know, and my sin's not as stinky as your sin. We can't do that. And when somebody comes back in repentance, we need to rejoice. We need to be happy about that. But nonetheless, let's not miss the point. Jesus said to the woman, where are your accusers? Are, are your accusers here? Does any man accuse you? No man, my Lord. Neither do I condemn thee because it wasn't his place in this role. He wasn't a witness. Go and sin no more. And that's the information. Go and sin no more. Repentance has to come. And that's what people do not understand. That when we speak out against sin, it's not because we hate them, but because we love them and we want to see them go to heaven. And we cannot convince people of the love of God. We cannot save them if they remain in their sin. Fornication is a sin. Sexual immorality is a sin. Do you know what Jude, the little book of Jude, is just one, one chapter. That's right before Revelation. You know, Jude and Revelation. And Jude, if you'll... Look at verse 4. It talks about individuals coming into the church. And Jude says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They are enemies, adversaries of the church. Sneaking into the Lord's church, His body. Bringing a doctrine of ungodliness and lasciviousness. This is a warning to be on guard. And you know, He gives several examples in this chapter. And one of them is in verse 7. Where it says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah. And the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You can't put it any plainer than that. Homosexuality is fornication. It's wrong. It's sinfulness. It's not just an alternative lifestyle. It's something that will condemn you. Just as God condemned Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain. This is spoken of over and over in the scriptures. In the book of Romans, let's go over to Romans chapter 1. It speaks of the progression of error. How can a people come to a place in which anything and everything goes? Well, it's because people think that they're smarter than the Lord. And verse 21 tells us, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God and neither were thankful. And that's a situation we have today. That there are a lot of people who, at least at one time, believed in God. But they didn't glorify Him. They didn't praise Him. They didn't thank Him. They weren't thankful. But they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. 
And then they became sophisticated. You know, that sophistication. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man. And to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. There it is. They became idolaters. They began worshiping idols and images of man and of birds and beasts and things. And we know all about the Greek gods and the Roman gods and the Egyptian gods. How sad it is that mankind turned from glorifying the true God to these things made with hands and to these beasts of the field. You know, if you read about the Greek gods and the Roman gods in history, and those people really believed in those things. They talk about how that they had to sacrifice to those gods because they were hungry and they needed to be fed. And they taught that, you know, as they were burning up that, those sacrifices, those animals, that the, the gods, you couldn't see them, but they were there. And they would come down, they'd go, mmm, this is good, I'm going to eat this up. And they would, they would start eating that sacrifice, and they would fill their bellies, and, and oh, that's wonderful, yum, 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 yum. If you read about those gods, then you find out that they were the bunch of gluttonous, murderous, lustful things and beings that you ever read about. And what happened was those civilizations flipped it around to where we believe that we are made in God's image. Those societies made God in their image. And it put a stamp of approval upon their behavior. So what did God do? Verse 24. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even the women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was made. Wild abandonment. Let's just do whatever we want to do. And the result was what we have in our society. LGBTQ2+, soon to be another PP. You know, it goes on and on and on. B, I, that's where we are, folks. That's where we are. We live in a world in which a lot of society is fast traveling toward the worship of mankind and not honoring and glorifying God. And what's God going to do about it? Verse 28. For even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Okay, if that's what you're going to do, you've got free will, go ahead and do it. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Fornication and wickedness and covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, and disobedient to parents. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They're worthy of death and they have died. They are separated spiritually from God. They've experienced a, a spiritual death because of the life that they have chosen. God does not make anybody obey Him. And it's not our duty to make anybody obey Him. But we still live in this world as lights that shines in darkness, holding forth the glorious gospel of the Lord that others may see that others may see the beauty of Jesus living in you. That others may say, hmm, 
uh, I, I want to see what this is all about. Sin is a bad life. Yes, there's some pleasure in sin. I'm not telling you there's no pleasure in sin. But it's limited. And short-lived. And in the end, it will cause you to lose your soul. Sexual immorality is one of the hallmarks of the person who has left the Lord. You say, well, where does that start? Well, first of all, it starts with a lack of understanding about how God set this world up and what marriage is. And when you start corrupting the idea of a true marriage, a man and woman who have the right to marry and God binds them together for life, that's, that's the intention. When you leave that model, then you compromise morality. And where you will end, who knows? Who knows where this will end for you? Where does it start? It starts with a lack of understanding and knowledge about the Word of God. Secondly, it starts a lot of times with the Internet. How about that, huh? Starts with you playing innocent little games and innocent little exercises that you do. And, and all of a sudden, this little, whoa, you want a date? And the, the weakness of youth sometimes, their curiosity gets the best of me. They punch that back. I know that happens because it happens to me. I, I've got a flip phone, people. And they're still sending me messages from time to time. Hey, you want to meet up? All right. Oh, yeah, she, she thinks she's pretty. Hmm, she's an overweight, middle-aged Russian. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's not the way they portray them, do they? And that might be a temptation to you. Push the lead, please. Never, never, never answer those things. And that's that 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 will lead you to a bad place and on a bad path. I remember getting one. Said that um, in the little little hole in the wall community I lived in called Zoe. Zoe, Kentucky. Z-O-E. Hello there. I'm lonely. I'm lonesome. And I live in Zoe too. You want to meet up? I mean, to me it's silly. To me it's stupidity. All right? But to someone who does not have a good knowledge and grounding in the Word, curiosity... Might get you to reply to that. And what does curiosity do? It kills the cat. Jesse's rejoicing. You know, curiosity kills the cat. That's, that's. <laughs> Pornography will rock your soul. Okay? And I will assure you that every one of our children will be have the opportunity to be exposed to it because they're not in our watch care 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So therefore, we better equip them to say no. Oh, you got the you know several years ago they said alcoholism was a disease. So therefore, you can't judge. You, you can't judge. Now we're headed toward pornography as a disease. Did you know that? Well, why do you say it's a disease? The same reason they say alcoholism is a disease. Because it affects the chemicals of the brain from long-term use. You see? And your dopamine drops and you, you need more. And so therefore you have to engage in that behavior more and more and more. Yeah, it's, it's like drugs. But you don't have to go through all of that horror. You don't have to have a broken heart and a broken home, broken relationships. What you got to do is just take, take a stand for God's morality. And still within your children, your nieces, your nephews, your cousins, your family, yourself, 
that we're having nothing to do with that demon-filled thing called pornography. If it's something that's been a part of your life, you better get rid of it and repent. These folks here, God gave them over to this reprobate mind, as the Scripture is telling us. And when I speak out against these LBGTQPI, whatever, I'm not speaking against that because I hate people. I don't hate them that practice those things. Jesus loved them enough to die for them. But they think that you hate them unless you accept their behavior and the life that they've chosen. And we can't do that. We can't do that. I was asked one time, because, you know, I preached at University Heights Congregation in Lexington on the University of Kentucky campus. When I left here, that's where I went. And uh, I was asked... Well, what would you do if some gay people came and they said, into your church? You know, that's the way they put into your church. Yeah. Well, I'd welcome them. I'd say, I'm glad you're here. And I'd preach a sermon that they would need to hear. And either that they would decide that they're going to listen and investigate God's will for them, or they would leave. And they would have no part of it. I mean, I mean what, what, what do we mean? It's as if people think that we're action and reaction is going to be take them out and stone them. Like the woman taken in adultery. That's not who we are. That's not what we do. Now we're not going to tolerate immorality in our midst. We're not. And if a man comes in dressed as a woman, we'll say, no, thank you. That's not acceptable here. Because the Bible condemns that. And if uh, someone comes in promoting error, I'm not going to accept that. But as long as they're not visibly and physically sinning in our midst, we're going to preach them a lesson. You know, someone reminded me of a visitor that we had back years ago. This lady came in and into this building and sat down. And as the Lord's Supper was beginning to be served, this lady got up out of her seat. And remember, she's walking in the bank. Shout and start shouting. All this stuff. Going on, moaning. Very disruptive. So I got up and headed back there. And when she saw me coming, she was out the back door. Now I caught up with her about halfway in the parking lot. I said, ma'am, come, come here, come here. I'm like, That's okay. I've been run out of every church around here. I said, I'm not running you off. I'm just here to explain to you that, you know, we don't do that. We do things decently in order. And um, I'd like for you to come back in. And be with us. Really? You're not running me off? I said, no. Oh. Okay, well, I'll think about it or whatever. And she left. You know, we're not going to have our services disrupted in that way. We're not going to tolerate that which God told us not to do. But we love that woman. We love her soul. And we want to teach her the truth. So where do we stand? Where do you stand on morality? Let's remember that we all used to be sinners. We still are in one sense of the word. But I'm talking about living a life of sin. And as 1 Corinthians chapter 6 informs us in verse 9, it, it, it takes a very strong viewpoint on these issues. It says, be not deceived. Uh, do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? And that's just the truth. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, that's the general term for sexual immorality, nor idolaters, okay, we know what that is, 
nor adulterers, those who break their vows, nor effeminate, that's soft to the touch, and that, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. So whichever word you want to use, it covers the whole gamut of homosexuality. Nor thieves, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you are washed, you are sanctified, and you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. There you go. The Corinthians used to be these things. They obeyed the gospel. They became believers. They were washed. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, you can obey the gospel. You can be a child of God. Yes, there are standards. We have to be faithful. And when you fall, when you as a babe in Christ stumble, pick yourself back up and ask for forgiveness. And we're here to help you this, this evening. We offer the invitation. Let's stand and sing the song selected. Oh, Jesus.